Good evening and thank you for joining us for tonight's Justice Now conversation. We will be getting started shortly. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, we really appreciate you joining us uh, at a later hour this evening, but it's a really important conversation and we just wanted to make space and time uh, to have this conversation um, with the Congresswoman. We will be starting shortly. I encourage all of you, if you have questions or comments, to share them. You know, just to share them in the chat. And, you know, I will definitely make sure that I lift them up for our guest. Um, give, I'll give a few more minutes just so we can get everyone in here. But again, thank you so much for joining for tonight's conversation. We'll be getting started shortly. Hello. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for tuning into tonight's conversation. I see that we have uh, Representative Jackson Lee here, so we will be getting started shortly. Hi, good evening to you. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm so glad you are able to join us. Uh, thank you so much for the hospitality and the opportunity to be with you and particularly to be with the National uh, Urban League uh, to thank them for decades of work. And of course, uh, President Mark Morial, well respected and well received and uh, well listened to as we work through the challenges of this nation. We thank you all so very much for your leadership. Well, thank you for your leadership. Um, I would like to just start out and just kind of set the stage for tonight's conversation for all those who joined in. Uh, we are really excited uh, to have this conversation essentially on um, the eve, or not quite the eve, but the upcoming eve of Juneteenth. Uh, so good evening to everyone who has joined us. My name is Jerrica Richardson and I serve as a Senior Vice President for Equitable Justice and Strategic Initiatives at the National Urban League. And so tonight's Justice Now conversation is focused on Juneteenth, um, its history, the origins, really the fight uh, in getting it to be a national holiday, which is known as Juneteenth National Independence Day, um, which we will be celebrating on Monday. Uh, and I thought, there could be no better uh, person to break it down for us than the Honorable Sheila Jackson Lee, Congresswoman from the great state of Texas and also my soar. And so I just wanted to say, welcome Congresswoman. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, it's my pleasure to be with you this evening and um, to be able to share uh, the importance of Juneteenth and the journey that is taken. I think. Uh, the congressional record uh, clearly shows that I was the first member of Congress to introduce uh, legislation to make uh, Juneteenth a federal holiday. Uh, as a representative from Texas, uh, we were surrounded by all of the um, facts and the emotion and the charge and the excitement of Juneteenth and the historic um, basis of Juneteenth, the, the seriousness of Juneteenth, the prayerfulness of Juneteenth. And really, it's about 
uh, one of America's original sins, and that is slavery. Something we just get away from from the historical perspective, and we should not. Uh, frankly, African Americans are the only population in the United States who've been held as slaves for 246 years. Uh, and uh, in that period, there were people who were born, babies were born, babies lived, they grew up to be adults, and they died as slaves over and over and over again. Families were separated, families were brutalized, uh, babies were um, separated from parents, uh, you became uh, the workers in the house, house workers, house uh, N-word they used to use uh, versus the field N-word that they used to use. Mm -hmm. Indignant that was so much so that people grew up calling themselves the N-word uh, because that was the only language that they knew. And so the Emancipation Proclamation first issued in 1863 was to free the slaves. It did not end slavery, but it was to free the slaves. But Juneteenth is totally separate because there were thousands of uh, slaves who did not get the word in 1863. And so that proclamation sent by President Lincoln had to be brought by General Granger by land and sea. And he landed uh, in um, Galveston, which is on the coast of Texas. Uh, how historic. And announced it right at that coast. Uh, the uh, general order, I believe, number 15, uh, that indicated that the slaves were free. It proclaimed that the slaves were free. And that general order is uh, an important and powerful order. Um, I will probably read it on Juneteenth this year, which falls on Sunday, in the federal holidays on Monday. But the gist of what I want to say about it was that he indicated uh, that the slaves were free, but that they could remain as laborers. In fact, he used the term, you know, almost don't get excited, um, calm down, and don't be nervous. You now can be an employee of the employer. So he was trying to suggest, he wanted to be the great calmer. He wanted to let the slave owners know, which by the way, people should know the slave owners received reparations, if you can believe it, for the slaves becoming free. They received reparations. But he wanted to calm, this, this is my interpretation of his words. He wanted to calm the slave owners oh my goodness, you're going to still have these workers. We're going to call them employees. And you're going to be uh, an employer. And it's going to be for reasonable wages. Well, uh, as the story goes, uh, there were few slaves, uneducated as most of them were, that even knew what the word employer and employee mm. meant. They'd been a slave with no compensation, no rights, uh, and uh, they were uh, not allowed to be independent or to come and go or to work for wages. And so the only thing they knew when they heard that was it was time to go. We are free. And out of that pronouncement, they began to move out of Galveston in droves. They began to march away from Galveston, away from the plantations, and make their way up to the small cities uh, going up to Houston and different parts of Houston, which has led me to also introduce legislation called the Emancipation Trail, which we are hoping that will be established in years to come. But Juneteenth is a sacred day. Uh, it is, in essence, a holy day for many because it was the freeing of people from the burden of brutality, from the separation of mothers and fathers, from the loss of babies. There were so many slave babies and birth that was still birth, that they died in birth. This is the kind of life that these women lived in because they were in the field. So Juneteenth for me is a very sacred day. But that's what it represents, the freeing of slaves two years later, but it really is the essence of freedom. And it probably goes to the point that freedom is never free. Wow, that was beautifully said. And thank you so much, Representative Jackson Lee, for sharing that history. I think there was some of the some of the information is something that we don't hear about on the from on the daily basis. And I will say I have 
family, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother's family hails from Calvert, Texas and are in Houston, Texas. And so it is so meaningful to have you really work and carry the torch and ensure uh, that Juneteenth was a national holiday, uh, that it was something that we're really educating folks across the country about the real history in America. And when we're thinking about the Emancipation Act Proclamation, it wasn't immediate um, for everyone in this country. And it really has been a long journey to freedom, which quite frankly, I think we continue to fight for every single day. Um, I wanted to take a step back because um, the signing of, of, of this uh, bill actually took place um, almost a year ago. Um, and it really falls on the heels of the uh, uprising and the focus on social justice uh, that we saw in 2020 with the tragic deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Can you connect the dots for us about how we were able to move something uh, that would have been critically important uh, to be recognized in this country years ago for quite some time, how you were able to lift this up and get it across the finish line? Well, we should always see Juneteenth in the fact that it was became law. And by the way, uh, it is the first federal holiday in 38 years. I think that should really sink in, in 38 years. You know, timing is everything, but also, as I indicated to you, Juneteenth is sacred, it is special. Um, it, is, it is surrounded by parties and music and barbecues, but my mission has been that once we pass this holiday, that every American, but every African American on that day take a moment of silence before you go off to do anything else to recognize that it is honoring the dead. It is talking about what happened uh, and it is saying that those who were in bondage are free. But it ties to freedom and the issues of uh, George Floyd's uh, most devastating deaths, unspeakable death, and of course, Brianna Taylor, a first responder, someone who's gonna be a nurse, uh, who was uh, in essence murdered as uh, individuals uh, who happened to be officers uh, entered uh, in a no-knock warrant. And in the dark of night, this innocent young woman was shot. A mother still mourns, as all the family members do. You know, we've been working on police reform for a long time. We would introduced legislation years ago, law enforcement, trust and integrity about police officers de-escalating, duty to care, uh, not using excessive force. Uh, all of that is good for police officers, first responders. But then, of course, came George Floyd and all of these things converged, dealing with the militarization of departments, uh, dealing with uh, the behavior of police, uh, the um, reckless behavior, uh, the issues of qualified immunity, as I indicated, training for police, funding for police, uh, not having a racial bias, racial profiling. Um, and we made this, and it came out. As a member of the Judiciary Committee, chairpersons worked very hard, and it got out of the House, got out of the committee. It got marked up, uh, and it actually, I think, drew some bipartisan support in the House of Representatives. But unfortunately, in the Senate, uh, it is a difficult process uh, with, of course, something called the filibuster that prevents good work from getting done. But we didn't give up. We kept pursuing this with Cory Booker, Senator Cory Booker, uh, Representative Karen Bass, myself, uh, Jerry Nadler, and just a myriad of, of members coming together. I remember seeing eight senators in one day with families of victims who had been, uh, who had lost their lives. Eight senators. I saw in one day, we went from place to place to place to place. Believe it or not, they all said, we're with you. Um, can it be worked out? Uh, you're working with Tim Scott. But mm -hmm. ultimately, that was not the route that we had to take. And so we worked with the White House over a period of months and weeks to get a refined executive order, which is law, signed. And we wrote this with the White House um, working with law enforcement, working with the families of the victims uh, and a myriad of civil rights lawyers and the Judiciary Committee and the Congressional Black Caucus. 
And we came up with the executive order, which was the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. And on uh, May 25th, two years to the day of the death of George Floyd, and the death of so many others, was signed to law as an executive order in the White House. It is now law, but it now has to be implemented. It has to be, there has to be oversight. We have to make sure that we are diligent. Because remember what I said, freedom is not free. No matter where you're dealing with it, voting rights, freedom is not free. Juneteenth, the sacredness of being reminded of the ancestors, slaves who never saw freedom, that's not free. And then the idea of police reform, that is not free. We continue to work to implement this. One of the other elements, recruiting young people to be police officers, different, uh, and to fill the ranks of police officers so that we can get our hands around this unspeakable violence, gun violence, get people from neighborhoods and communities where these things are happening. And so we believe that the police reform executive order is going to change uh, the way of policing in terms of community relations and make it better for the community, uh, for African Americans in the community, for all people in the community, and make it better for law enforcement. Well, thank you so much for your advocacy on both of these issues. I think it's critically important um, that we lift this work up and that everyone that's tuning in recognizes that we all have to play an active role uh, in this work. It doesn't end, your role doesn't end when you just, you know, you fill out your ballot or cast your ballot at the ballot box. We need to um, become vigilant um, and continue to lift this work up continue to call for changes in our community that are so desperately needed. I want to just take a step back and go back to Juneteenth for a moment. Um, you said how important it is for us to pause and take a moment and to honor our ancestors. Um, I, I, I really want to emphasize that because when we talk about Juneteenth, yes, there are all different celebratory things that happen but I would, would love to hear from you, Congresswoman, in addition to that pause and that taking time to think and think about and honor our ancestors, how else would you encourage folks to celebrate this national holiday? I know when we talk about um, uh, the birthday of Martin Luther King Jr., uh, which is now celebrated as a, a national holiday, um, most times we remind folks that it's just not a day off, that it's a day uh, really that should be committed to service. And so what would you recommend for those who may just be starting to engage uh, and learn more about Juneteenth uh, in this year two of it being a national holiday? Well, draw together with your family, with your community, uh, with your friends. It should be a day of recounting the history of slavery in America. And obviously it falls on different days. Uh, this happens to fall on a Sunday. Again, the national holiday is on Monday. But on Sunday, for example, uh, people of faith uh, who happen to find their way into houses of worship, say a prayer uh, for the ancestors. Uh, let the church know that today, June 19th, Juneteenth, is a day of freedom, but is also a day to acknowledge that there were people who built this country, built the wealth of this country, made cotton king, built the Wall Street banks, created the land itself, literally built Europe and the United States on the richness of cotton that they built on their backs, built the White House, built uh, the United States Capitol where I am right today. Tell those stories so that children continue to tell them. So in your place of worship, call ahead of time, ask the pastor uh, or whatever uh, place you may be whether you or someone can make mention that the day is Juneteenth, honor the ancestors, say a prayer, and then get with your local librarians. They would love it. Take some time uh, to go into the library where children may be and have a moment as you read books, but tell the story of Juneteenth. It is not that complicated and children just love even a few words to be able to tell them it was about freedom, a picture of a slave, that they uh, picked cotton, that that is their ancestor, that it helped build America. And you can explain to them that it built the White House, it built the United States Capitol, uh, and really create a story. And then I think it never hurts uh, to engage in service. There's so much that needs to be done. There are 
uh, shelters where abused women are. Uh, there are juvenile centers where uh, young people are incarcerated. Uh, and juvenile centers, as you well know, are young people that are in there for a myriad of reasons. Uh, maybe you want to expose yourself or have them exposed under supervision, of course, uh, to what is waiting for them uh, when, when they are out. Uh, juvenile uh, detention is not a criminal uh, place. Uh, it is a place where children go who are not criminally charged. So maybe you want to ex be exposed to them. Maybe you want to spend a day at a day camp uh, to be able to explain uh, what Juneteenth is. And of course, if there's a parade that welcomes the community, get right in it. Opal Lee, I call, uh, I'm called the godmother of Juneteenth, Opal Lee and mother of Juneteenth. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Fort Worth resident who brought to us in Congress almost a million petitions for Juneteenth. And she's having a parade. She's having a walk. Uh, there'll also be a walk in Galveston, and it will uh, commemorate, just like I said, when the slaves were free, they moved, they walked. Even though they were told they could be an employee, an employer, they didn't know what that meant. It meant maybe their freedom was going to be denied. They walked. Why don't you do a walk in your community to slaves leave Galveston and seeking their freedom after that proclamation? So anything that brings it is simple. It could be 20 people. And your community, what are they walking for? They're honoring Juneteenth and the movement of slaves in their freedom. So take a moment to do something under the banner of Juneteenth. Uh, and I think the last easy thing for you can do is social media and do a Twitter storm. Do a Twitter storm that says, what about you? I'm commemorating Juneteenth. And use the word commemoration and then celebration. You're honoring. And then let me, I couldn't end by saying, you leap from Juneteenth. I always said it was the beginning, the beginning for police reform, the beginning for passing voting rights. We have not yet passed the John Robert Lewis Voting Rights Act. Uh, it is a leap for passing H.R. 40, a commission to study slavery and develop reparation proposals. And that is a bill that I have uh, championed now for uh, a very long time. It has been introduced for 38 years. And I want people to push forward uh, to the Congress, to the White House, we must have the executive order of H.R. 40. And that is a bill that says to study slavery, to establish a commission, to go around the nation, to hold hearings on what the ultimate impact of slavery was on African-American communities and larger communities, and in fact, to be able to develop. This is not just a study, real reparation proposals that would address the disparities in this country of African-American, Juneteenth, H.R. 40, Juneteenth, voting rights, Juneteenth, police reform, Juneteenth, the elimination of bias and racial bias, Juneteenth, the study of African-American history and telling stories in our uh, schools, Juneteenth, getting rid of the CTE, uh, critical race theory that people have utilized uh, as uh, a detriment and make it what it is, studies in graduate school, let's get back to talking about the history that little children can understand that makes all of them care about each other, no matter what race or color or creed they are. Let's get back to loving each other. Juneteenth brings all of this together. Don't forget HR 40. You can do that on that day by tweeting, pass HR 40, the commission to study and develop reparation proposals. Well, I love that. I mean, you tied it all together. Um, uh, and I think it was really important. You talked about how we celebrate um, and the focus was on educating. And then you also talked within that, the service that we can do with our young people and how we can educate our young people, which is, is critically important. I would say that the passage of this national legislation really did result in very much of a backlash uh, where, as you mentioned before, the concept of critical race theory um, uh, really, I think, garnered a lot of attention, and, and it was not uh, appropriately named. I, the, what folks have been trying to do in schools throughout the country is just to be honest about our history. Uh, I don't think we can really move forward um, and, and improve in this country if we continue to ignore the sins of the past, which obviously H.R. 40 is, I think, a first step in addressing some of those things. 
Can you talk a little bit more about critical race theory um, and why it's important to really uh, explain what it is versus what it is not? And also to distinguish critical race theory, and I said CTA before, so all of you, uh, it is, uh, I've got another piece of legislation on my mind. It's critical race theory. Um, and so all of you are in the chat room, make sure we get it, critical race theory and distinguish it from what um, uh, Kwame or um, Latifa uh, is learning in fourth grade or second grade. Mm -hmm. or Mary or Jose or Maria is learning in this of history. And it is shameful, shame, shame on State Board of Education who've made a mockery of teaching little children about their history, made a mockery of denying teachers their right to be creative with uh, coloring books and drawings, the kind of things that children enjoy they're like sponges. They soak up knowledge. So you're going to throw Booker T. Washington, George Washington Carver, and the, the inventor of the light bulb, or the, and, and the various wonderful historic leaders, Dr. Martin Luther King, Andy Young, um, Abernathy, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman. You're going to throw that into denying that kind of social studies because you are telling an untruth about critical race. That is not critical race theory. And I just raise up parents of all children, but particularly African-American children. Don't take this laying down. Get to your school boards and your state education agencies and say, we pay taxes, we will not have it. We will not have you not teaching our children and all children. Because maybe that would stop young white men from taking up semi-automatic weapons and murdering people in Buffalo because they're black, because they are uh, black, or in El Paso because they're black. Tell the truth. Now, critical race theory, hear me as a lawyer, critical race theory is the analysis of race in the impact of laws in America. So it is mostly taught in grad school and in law school, how race permeates the legal system, redlining, discrimination in access to capital, the discrimination in the soldiers who came home after World War II when you announced you had a GI Bill, but all did not get it. If they went to the South, only white soldiers got the GI Bill, not black soldiers. Discrimination, that's what the critical race theory is. The permeate, permeating of our laws and treatment uh, of African Americans in particular through an unfair system because of race. The justice system, more African Americans on death row, more African Americans incarcerated in sentences of 25 years and above because of a drug offense. We had to correct that with the Sentencing Reduction Act that had been worked on for at least a decade, working on First Step Act, uh, dealing with rolling back these devastating laws that were biased toward black people. That's the study of critical race theory. But the social studies of learning about who we are and what is the history of Native Americans in America, what is the history of white Americans in America? It may be German Americans, Irish Americans, Italian Americans. What is their history? Americans that are Anglo-Saxon, what is the history of uh, Indo-Americans from India uh, and those from Pakistan? What is the history of Africans who have recently come, Haitians, the Caribbean, South and Central America? That's what you learn in social studies. That's what you learn about your history. And it also may help you as you get into middle school and high school to have a better understanding of why I don't have to hate this person Mm. me why not become a young white male that wanted to create a race war or wanted to uh or believed in the re replacement theory that black people were here to replace whites maybe he missed 
understanding black people and what they have contributed in his early years. He didn't get it from home, didn't get it from school. And so he developed hatred of what he did not know. I am very clear tonight, whoever is listening that is part of leadership in your community, your faith community, in your uh, Panhellenic community, in your civic community, as I said, in your employment, employee community, just plain being out there community, friends community, you have a task. Juneteenth is not just here for Juneteenth, it's about freedom. And you need to fight to let your boys and girls be free to learn about themselves. In the alternative, you better set up school in your, uh, in your home as relates to social studies and the knowledge about your own family and their grandmother and grandfather and great grand. You must instill in them knowledge of the glory of who they are, of the greatness of who they are, of the kingly and queenly heritage that they have. But your fight should be that you should not have your child denied learning their history, social studies, and all little children learning it in their schools. It is a fight that we should not give up. Juneteenth is action. It is freedom. It is a national holiday to honor those who have never been honored. For me, it is a sacred day. And we will be in Houston, Texas at the Antioch Baptist Church in downtown Houston, surrounded by skyscrapers, because that's where black people settled in Houston. That's where the freed slaves came. And the one lone survivor is a historic Antioch Baptist Church founded by freed slaves. We will be there on Sunday, Juneteenth, as we've been commemorating on um, Friday and Saturday here in, in Houston, in Houston, I'm not in Houston yet, and in Galveston, but we'll be at Antioch Baptist Church. Anyone who's on this in the Houston area, tweet it out, Antioch Baptist Church, only one in downtown Houston to pray and to give honor to the slaves that died, born, lived, and then died, and never were spoken over or honored. We're gonna do that in Houston, Texas. I commend all of you to do something in your places of worship. If you find yourself in a faith institution or in a meeting, just say a word. Today is Juneteenth. Let us honor those who never saw freedom and let us celebrate freedom. Those simple words, I believe the ancestors might just smile. And they will also smile if we use Juneteenth as an action day for freedom and for speaking about freedom and demanding our rights as relates to teaching our children and demanding H.R. 40 uh, to be passed, the Commission to Study and Develop Reparation Proposals, and as well to find some place to do a little bit of good. John Lewis said, get into a little bit of good trouble on Juneteenth. He didn't use it for Juneteenth, but I'm taking his words because he's a dear lady. <laughs> a little bit, so if you can get a little bit of trouble on Juneteenth, uh, helping people, I know it'll make all of the ancestors smile. I love that. You know, I had the opportunity to intern for Congressman Lewis, and so I think he would be very proud of you using his words in such a way. Um, as you were talking about the upcoming celebrations uh, and commemorations of Juneteenth that are happening, uh, especially at Antioch, I saw a number of folks in the chat saying they'll be there. Uh -huh. um, so we're going to hold you all to that, you know, um, and so we appreciate you, um, Congresswoman, just really sharing your light, uh, inspiring us, and, and informing people about much needed, a uh, very much needed holiday, but also our history as it, uh, as it pertains to slavery in this country, the need for us to continue moving forward on reparations, uh, and also pushing back a bit against the misinformation related to critical race theory. You encourage folks uh, to make sure they got involved in their school boards. Uh, and I'll, I'll take it a step forward and just remind people because you lifted it up earlier. When we talk about voting rights in this country, when we talk about civic engagement, when we talk about showing up to the polls, um, it's important that you do that. And it's important that you support lawmakers and folks who are running that are committed to truth telling in this country, who are committed to making sure that America reconciles with itself and that our children get an accurate understanding of history. 
And I, I, I fundamentally believe the lack of education uh, on our history in this country has, as, as the Congresswoman said, really led to some of the challenges and problems that we are seeing with hate, with extremism, with gun violence. Um, so we all do have a responsibility to engage uh, and move forward and continue to educate and commemorate um, the history of African Americans and other people of color in this country, because it's all of our history. It's American history. Uh, Congresswoman, I thank you so much for joining us. If there's any final words or final thoughts you want to share uh, with those who have tuned in, uh, please do so now. Well, thank you for your um, both a striking and powerful closing as well. Uh, my message, if I might, uh, is there is no rest for the weary. Um, the journey is your journey. Your destiny is yours. It has to be a vigorous and vigilant destiny. Not only do we have the responsibility of uplifting the race, the people, that used to be said in the 1800s and 1900s, the W. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington lifting the race, fun, by putting your buckets down where you were and working with your hands. No conflict. The brothers actually got along. W. Du Bois wanted the talented tenth to use their skills, not selfishly, but to bring it back for their people, to show their people what a grand uh, intellectual body of people African Americans were. Where are we now? We cannot be lax, complacent, not seen, not heard. Our voices should be everywhere. And our action should be, it's really important to be eagerly looking at things that are occurring and getting in the mix. Getting in the mix if things are not happening right in the school district of which you have no children. Uh, but yet you have children, little black boys and girls and others who need your voice to say they should be learning about our rich history. Then there are people who are desperate, mothers uh, who are single parents who would welcome to be mentored by someone who is a W.E. Du Bois talented 10th to give them the guideposts that yes, you can. And then we need to understand that legislation should not go over our head. It should be one that we are familiar with. You need to be familiar with the work that we're doing, whether it's the state legislature, the city council. I ask you to realize the work that is being done here. Had it not been for the American Rescue Act, for example, people would be in the streets evicted. We would not be vaccinated. We'd not have to have a test. Uh, for COVID, which is still going on. And the numbers would have been so severe. The money that was given to local jurisdictions, the child tax credit that was given, it kept people afloat. And now we have challenges from inflation, high gas prices, but are you in the mix to realize the trajectory of where that is? And to be able to say to black folk that there is a brighter day, there is a future. There is a future because you have a Juneteenth federal holiday that is not the beginning uh, it is not the end, it is the beginning. It is the day that you can honor slaves, but you also have the ability to pass and to push for legislation that will actually study the connection of slavery to where we are today and to develop those reparation proposals that are the big umbrella that covers all, that we have gotten a roadmap to deal with police community relationships. We can fight against gun violence by ourselves, speaking out against the proliferation of guns and to get the right kind of mix for a bill that respond to black people and white people and Hispanic people and all people to cease the violence that has taken over our community. Action is what I'm calling for. Action of your ancestors. A recollection that we are connected. We may have been a long time away from the continent, but we have a connection and we have a home and that home is here. That home is here, but our connection it's to the Caribbean, to Africa, to South and Central America. Our brothers and sisters are everywhere. But use your spirit of strength and knowledge to stand on the shoulders of the ancestors to continue to make America see through you what a great people we are. And to be able to show that in how we solve problems and how we are free and how we honor freedom and how we make sure that those who come from, uh, come behind us. As Dr. Martin Luther King told us in his last days, of 1968 on April 3rd, we all remember that he said he had been to the mountaintop. He had seen the promised land. He knew that he might not get there with us.
but he knew that we as a people would get there someday. Old words, but breathe life into them. It is as true then, in 1968, as it is for you Twitter, Twitterers, excuse me, Instagram, <laughs> um, TikTok, and folk that are on YouTube and Facebook. It's true today that there is a promised land. Are you going to get there by your action, your work, your acknowledgement, your respect, your dignity, your perseverance, your determination, your recognition that the ancestors deserve honor? And you honor them by your action and making sure that you change that what needs to be changed. I'm gonna keep working. My last point is I wanna make sure I'm gonna be introducing, I've introduced legislation to make white supremacy that generates into violence a crime. I don't have a, uh, it is separated from speech. It is when white supremacy takes on this violent action and people become victims, that people die. And that is something that cannot be tolerated. I continue my journey to purge out what is wrong uh, with our laws and what is wrong with America. At the same time, my journey to uplift our people through Juneteenth, through reparations, and through, of course, uh, the uh, issue of ensuring that we tell our story by an emancipation trail, a national trail to emphasize the history of African America. Keep working. That's what I want. Well, thank you, Congressman. You have. Congresswoman, you certainly have done that. You have lifted this up. Uh, and leadership is action, not position. And so thank you for encouraging folks to continue to act. Uh, it's critically important that we do that. Um, I will, and from the, on behalf of the National Urban League, thank you for your work. Thank you for continuing to push forward on behalf of your constituents, but quite frankly, on behalf of all African-Americans and all people in this country. Um, we really appreciate your work uh, and we are here to support you. Uh, all of our members in the movement are, are very much focused on the issues that you raised today. So if there's anything that we can do uh, to ring the alarm, uh, to get folks to show up and, and turn out or to write members of Congress on behalf of these issues, uh, please let us know and we will continue to lift it up. Um, and so I want to also say thank you to everyone who's tuned in and joined us this evening. Um, we had a powerful word from the Congresswoman and I hope you share it with others and share it with friends and make sure that on Monday and on, on Juneteenth, the actual, the 19th as well, uh, that you remember our ancestors, that you commemorate them that you celebrate them, but that you also educate those in your community and those around you of all the important issues that we discussed today. The work continues, but remember, the time for justice is always now. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you. Take care. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.